All right, go live. All right, we're live. Good evening, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on when and where you're watching this Facebook Live. This is Voice on the Face of Dr. Tolu Olabintin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Living Spring Family Medical Center in the beautiful, but rather cold now, now, city of Mansfield, Texas, not too far from Dallas, where we help our patients live long and well because we believe the quality of life is just as important as the quantity of life. I always say I'm excited to do this, but I am particularly excited <laughs> to have our second time, well, this is not the first time she's here, our return guest, Dr. Delia Sheramonte. Um, she is amazing. For those of you who watched her before, and today we'll be talking about caring for dementia, practical tips for caregivers and loved ones. Doc, thank you so much for coming again. It's a pleasure to see you and to talk with you again live. Thank you so much for having me. I love talking to you. I can't wait. All right. Awesome. 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 So that being said, for those who are wondering, well, I haven't seen her before. This is my first time. Could you kindly introduce yourself? Who are you and what do you do? Sure. I am Dr. Delia Carabanti. I started out as a family doctor and now I'm an integrative palliative medicine doctor. And I'd love to tell you that journey. So I am uh, the founder of the Integrative Palliative Institute and also author of the upcoming book, Coping Courageously, A Heart-Centered Guide to Navigating a Loved One's Illness Without Losing Yourself. Wow. Okay. Doc, how did you, how did you, how did you get, I mean, that's, 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 that's a long uh, route, I guess. Um, how, why, why do you do what you do? What got you to this niche? Yeah. So I started as a family doctor and it was great and I loved it. But what I found was that a lot of the patients that I had had chronic things or serious things, pain, anxiety, fatigue, and the medicines that I learned about in medical school didn't fix that. And I did all the tests and I looked for their thyroid and their blood count and we did cancer screening. And often there was nothing, but they felt terrible. And I really was struck that I must there's some way was a disconnect between what I learned in medical school and what people were coping with. And so I ended up with a group of patients with chronic fatigue and chronic pain. And I didn't know what to do. So I just started treating them as whole people and using some of the wellness things that I had used for myself. And lo and behold, they got better and their fatigue got better and their pain got better and their anxiety and depression got better. And so I had this epiphany of what on earth is this? And why didn't I learn this in medical school? And that turned out to be the field of integrative medicine. And so for a long time, I was in the field of integrative medicine. I was the associate director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at a medical school, University of Maryland. And that was great. But then by accident, I ended up as a hospice doctor part-time. And I loved the, the depth of the conversations of people mm -hmm. who were dealing mm -hmm. with really mm -hmm. difficult things. And so then for a while, I was in two separate worlds, integrative medicine world and the palliative care hospice world. And then it became crystal clear to me that they really should be together and that the integrative approach to taking care of people with serious illness is the best way to address the whole person, to reduce suffering in the patient, in the family, and even in the clinicians who take care of them. So that pivoted my whole career into integrative palliative medicine. Wow. And you do what you do so well. I've watched your videos. Um, okay. I've, I've listened to you talk on other people's platforms. Of course, I've had you as a guest too. Um, so patients are very, very lucky and blessed to have you. Uh, and I'm glad that you do what you do. It's funny you said by accident. <laughs> <laughs> it was a beautiful, beautiful accident. It was a happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. So all right. So today uh, we're, we're talking about dementia and, and I guess the focus here is on the caregivers and the loved ones of those who, you know, who struggle with this diagnosis. Can you briefly explain what dementia is and why it's important for the caregivers to kind of really understand what that is? Sure. So dementia is a, a kind of bucket term that can include a bunch of different specific conditions, but big picture, it's a a complex condition that involves cognitive decline. So the, the lessened ability to uh, remember things, to figure out how to do things, and then also behavioral changes and sleep changes, appetite changes. So one of the things that I think is important to know is that just simple 
you know, I, I can't find a word sometimes, or I forgot where I put my keys. That is not dementia. Sometimes people worry, oh my gosh, like I forgot where my keys, do, do I have dementia? Mm -hmm. No, probably not. That is normal. But when mm -hmm. people have a clear dementia illness, they may do things like um, no longer be able to figure out how to work the stove or put mm -hmm. the keys in the refrigerator or forget people that they absolutely should know, like family members. So dementia is often slowly progressive. Some of them are faster, mm -hmm. but the most common type is slowly progressive. So I would say probably the biggest issue is that people often don't notice it or maybe close their eyes and ears and choose not to see it until it's quite far along. And, and maybe it would be beneficial to to admit it and get help and get diagnosed a little mm -hmm. bit earlier. Okay. And that's, that's fair. And, and so you, you'd already alluded to my next question. Are there early signs and symptoms that, you know, people should really say, Hey, this is something I should have her or him looked at sooner than later. Uh, what are common early signs and symptoms of yeah. dementia that caregivers should be aware of? So telling the same story right at this, like I told it five minutes ago and I just told it now that's not normal. That's different than just, I forgot where I put my keys. So that should be of concern. Not being able to do things that they used to be able to do. So maybe they used to be able to balance their checkbook or do their taxes. And now it feels confusing and they can't, they just can't figure it out anymore. Or they used to be able to cook a large dinner and now can't figure out how to follow the recipe. Those are concerning things. But I would say that if anyone has any doubt about a loved one, if they're just feeling like they're not the same, their memory is not the same, they can't do things the same as they used to, getting an early diagnosis is a really good idea. And and maybe the diagnosis is no, they don't have dementia. But I think it's important to get help from either a, a geriatrician or a neuropsychologist, or if it's advanced, a palliative care doctor to get a diagnosis. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, now we're going to focus now on the, the tips for caregivers and, and how to take care of their family members who struggle with, with dementia. Cause we're, we're right at that point, right? Um, are there tips for managing the behaviors, the mood swings, um, that are often associated with dementia? Um, and, and I'm asking this question because sometimes, you know, caregivers feel frustrated. They feel like, you know, I'm doing the best I can and, and, yeah. um, it, it hurts, this is yeah. still someone I love and care about. And sometimes they act like they don't know me. Um, what yeah. what are tips you you would say, Doc, to help? Boy, you're so right. It does hurt, and I think that's the first thing just to say is that if you are caring for a loved one with dementia, it is really hard. It is really hard, and it's not hard because you're doing it wrong. It's just really hard all mm -hmm. the time for everyone. So. That's important because part of caring for the loved one is caring for ourselves too. And and caregivers can carry a lot of guilt and shame, even like, did oh, I I fussed at her yesterday. I should be more patient. You know, why why can't I be this saint all the time? Or why do I feel like it's so hard? Mm -hmm. But it's just really hard. So we should say that first. Fair. Okay. Now, what else can they do? Um you know, many people with dementia have behavioral challenges. So they may get agitated or angry. And in the beginning, before people really realize that their loved one has dementia, they may try to argue with them or rationalize with them. Like, no, you shouldn't do that. Remember, I told you yesterday, you should do it this way. That is not helpful. And often what happens is that can escalate the person's, the, the, person with dementia is their agitation because they pick up on energy. So if we mm -hmm. feel agitated, like I told you that, that will agitate them too. So part of managing their behavior is keeping ourselves as chill and calm as possible. That's one. Now, mm -hmm. it is worth looking at are there, are there things that we can do to make it better? So sometimes side effects of medications can cause agitation in people with dementia. So having the geriatrician or primary care doctor or a neuropsychologist take a look at their medication list is a really good idea because maybe taking away or reducing one of those medications might improve their behavior. So that's one thing to try. 
sometimes undiagnosed depression in a person with dementia can cause agitation. And so that's also worth talking about with the primary care doctor, geriatrician, or neuropsychologist. Could there be depression? Let's see, let them do an assessment. And so treating depression sometimes can reduce agitation. That's another. Sleep is really important. Uh -huh. So sleep can be hard in people with dementia, but also we should try everything we can to make sleep a priority. So have it be quiet, have it be dark, try not to have the person nap during the day, if at all possible, so that they're tired at night. Don't give them anything with caffeine after about noon. So, um, you know, have a sort of a wind down, calming ritual before bed that might include music that they like, or even a, a, some aromatherapy, like lavender, or even a hand massage or something that helps their body calm down before sleep mm -hmm. can be helpful. Those, those are, are some of the key tips that I would say to start with. I love that. So um, make sure medications are not a cause of unnecessary agitation, good sleep, you mentioned, um, treating the depression, mm -hmm. making sure that's addressed. Um, I like the, the emphasis on good sleep, on how to kind of have a good sleep routine or sleep hygiene for them to help lull them into sleep. Um, now, my, my next question is this, and I have this asked often, you know, for the family member who is like, I'm still trying to engage and connect with my, my parent or my mom, my dad. Are there activities that you would encourage um, that could help? Um, with or could benefit um, individuals with uh, dementia where both parties are able to engage? Do you have any tips for that? Absolutely. So of course it depends on how advanced their dementia is. So yeah, people yes. with, with less severe dementia can do much more. Uh, but the key there is to match the activity to what they're able to do. So you may have to modify an activity that they used to like or used to be able to do and be sure to modify it so that they can enjoy it now. So if they used to play bridge, but they can't play bridge anymore, maybe they can play other simpler card games, for example. And okay. so you want to set them up for success because yeah. people who have dementia have feelings the same as everybody else. And so they get frustrated and, and upset and ashamed and angry at themselves. So you want to set them up to be successful. So think about what did they like to do before? And are there ways that we can modify that thing so that they can still do it. Like, did they used to play golf, but now they can't play golf, but they could come in the golf cart while the rest of us play golf. Maybe they would enjoy that as an example. Um, they can, if they're able to ambulate, able to walk, take them for a walk. If they like that, go to the mall, go shopping. Many people, even with pretty severe dementia, can still go out to lunch if they enjoy that. So connecting with them in Things that they like that are modified for whatever their ability is, is really important. And then the other thing that's important to remember is that long-term memory is preserved longer. So they may remember all the words to songs that they knew when they were in their 20s, for example. So if there's music that they used to love, play that music. If there are, are, are word games or, or things, songs, poems that they used to mm. like, bring those back in. They may not be able to remember what happened last week, but they may remember with a pristine ability what happened 40 years ago. So bring those in. And, and I would say probably one of the biggest things is to manage our own as the caregiver frustration and try to be in the moment and enjoy this connection with this person who's important to you. It doesn't matter if they forget stuff. It doesn't matter if they can't play bridge anymore. It doesn't matter if they mm. can't cook mm. with you the way they used to. Mm. You're still together. The music's playing. You're having a, an emotional connection with that person. And that's really what matters. So if we can focus on that and enjoy the moment, then we don't get agitated and they don't get agitated. And we can turn what could be an, a negative experience into a positive experience, even if their abilities are not that great anymore. Yeah. Um, I wanted to highlight some things that you said that really resonated with me. You said, you know, still have activities with them that you used to enjoy, but then there it where you, you, you set them up for, for success. So yeah. make it easier. A Scrabble game could be like, just put tiles together as opposed to exactly. spell a word. Exactly. Um, um, and, and, and taking out ways to dispel some of the frustration where, 
you tease out the benefits in the moment because um, that, that can be hard, but you got to maximize the moments with them um, as, as frustrating as that can, and that can be. And that, that, and that segues into my next question, doc, like the balance, you know, where the caregiver also needs to take care of themselves. So they're not less likely to be frustrated or less likely to be agitated. Yeah. What, what tips do you give caregivers on how to also maintain some level of support and prevent burnout and taking care of their loved ones? Probably number one, two, and three is to get more help than you think you need. The biggest mistake mm -hmm. that caregivers make is they say, no, I got it. I'm okay. I don't need help yet. And they, till they're hanging on by their fingernails, you know, almost everybody should try to get help sooner than they think they need it. And that help could be family members. Like, can you come stay with mom every Saturday so I can go out? That could be paid caregiving. It could be a facility. It could be sending the, the person with dementia to a day care program. But almost always people should get help sooner than they think they need it. So that's number one, two, and three, because this stuff is hard. It's really hard. And just because you can do it for another week, another month does not mm. mean you should because, because the caregiver has to fill themselves up too so that they can be really present with their loved ones so that they can bring calm and loving energy instead of frustrated energy. So it really is better for the patient, even if the caregiver takes care of themselves, because then they're more fun, they're nicer, they're calmer, they're more loving. And that's important to the patient, the person with dementia. I love it. Get more help than you think you need. Um, get that set up. You know, those who can bring you groceries, those who can watch every so often so you can get a little breather or take a quick nap. Um, yeah. Exactly. Powerful tips, but it sounds so simple, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> Let me add one more thing though. You're so yes, right. Please. So there's the there's the help for the for your loved one. But the other thing you can do, which you just suggested is so smart, is you can get help for the other just sort of dumb things in your life so that you're not so burdened. Like if you don't already have someone helping you clean the house, get someone to help you clean the house, get someone to bring your kids home from school, have groceries delivered, get someone else to do the lawn, like get all that you can off of your plate so that you aren't so depleted because people who are depleted when they're doing a hard thing, it's even harder. So get everything you can off of your plate, get all kinds of help with all kinds of things so that you don't feel so depleted. Mm -hmm. true, true talk. And I'm putting it down there on the bottom of the screen, get more help than you think you need. Cause it's very, very important. And not let it stay there for a few more seconds. <laughs> That's so important. <laughs> it's the mo probably the most important thing. And people um, resist it. They resist it. Yes. They really feel like, no, I can do it. People almost, they take it on. Like I have to do it. It's mine to do. I shouldn't have anyone else help me. And it's, it's really not good, not only for the caregiver, but even for the patient. So I just think it's important to say over and over again, because so many people feel hesitant to get help. It's not just they don't think of it or, you know, oh, I'm not sure how to do it. They, It could be right in front of them. And many people will say, no, I can do it. So I just encourage everybody to really look at that and just say, you know what? I'm just going to get help because it will make me feel better. And then I'll be a happier person and I will be a better caregiver for my loved one. If I'm a happier person. Yes. Yeah, almost feels like the, no, it's my burden to carry. This is yeah. my, this is, I'm the family member. It's I'm meant to, to do this by myself. And that's not necessarily true. So thank you for um, emphasizing that. Um, my next question is um, based on, you know, your experience and encounters that you have so as much as rich and as much as they have been, are there any misconceptions or stigmas around dementia that you'd like to address or kind of crush while we're here? Um, yeah, I, I think um, one of them is the difference between delirium and dementia. So okay. people get really confused about that. Sometimes okay. if you have an older person in your life and they go into the, uh, the hospital, so maybe at home they're living alone and doing fine, they go into the hospital with a urinary tract infection, for example, and all of a sudden they're, they may be screaming and staying up all night and they don't recognize anybody. And the, the person, and maybe even some of the hospital folks might say, oh, this person has dementia. But if they didn't have dementia last week, they don't have it this week. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. delirium. So delirium can look just like dementia, but it happens really quickly, 
often when someone has an infection or pain or goes to the hospital. So if you have a loved one who didn't have seem to have dementia last week, then they go to the hospital, then they're really confused. That's not dementia. So I think that okay. is an important um, distinction. It, it may mean that you know, in five years, they may show some signs of dementia. It may be an early, 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 early sign, but it doesn't mean that they have a diagnosis of dementia. So okay. that's that's one thing. Um, and then I think the other biggest misconception is many people feel like they have a suspicion about their loved one, but there's no diagnosis. And they think, oh my gosh, if she gets the diagnosis or he gets the diagnosis, it will be terrible. Like it will crush them. And so we, they kind of put blinders on and don't bring it up to the doctor and just kind of pretend like everything's fine because okay. the idea of getting a diagnosis feels like it will be so much worse than okay. whatever there is going on right now. And, and I have seen the exact opposite of that, which is that once there is a diagnosis, Everybody understands more what's happening and you can make plans. So rather than saying, oh, mom, you know how mom is. She forgets stuff sometimes and everyone's like, okay, we're just pretending everything's fine. Hmm. But then sometimes you might get agitated with mom. Like, well, mom, I told you that yesterday. Whereas once you get the diagnosis, if someone says your loved one has Alzheimer's, moderate Alzheimer's, for example, then you're less likely to get angry at mom because she doesn't remember because it's not her fault. It's the disease. And hmm. when, when it's time to talk about, maybe it's not safe to drive anymore. It's not because we don't trust you, mom, or we think, you know, you don't know how to do it anymore. It's because you have a condition. That's why. So it allows the, the person and the family to kind of blame all the things on the condition. And it allows people to make decisions like, if it's early on and the person is still able to do an advanced directive to decide where they might want to live, do they want to move to a facility? What do they want to do with the things in their home? Are there legacy projects that they want to make for their grandchildren, for example? And if you, if you cover your eyes and pretend it's not happening for too long, you miss the opportunity to do all of those important things. Mm -hmm. That's key. That's key. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, my next to last question is, are there uh, you know, support um, networks or resources that you have that you'd recommend? Um, because I, 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 I mean, I'm thankful for Google, but you have to do a guided Google search. Um, right. But are there resources or support networks or books or, you know, that you think are available for caregivers and loved ones dealing with dementia that they can use to help through that season or this season of their life? Sure. There, there are many, many, many books actually on the specifics of having a loved one with dementia. Um, what I really think is the best place to start though, is with a supportive clinician. And that is often a neuropsychologist. They will have so many resources. They'll be able to answer the specific questions like, is it okay for dad to drive? Who's going to tell dad he can't drive? They will do that. For mm -hmm. example, is it okay for mom to live alone? These are the things that really people struggle with tremendously. And that one, you can't really get answered from a support group. That one really does need a clinician, right? Like, can mom live alone? Do we have to disable the stove to make sure that she mm -hmm. stays mm -hmm. safe, right? Um, do we have to take the car keys away, does somebody need to be there 24 seven or not? Those are the questions that are really important. And I think for some reason, people often don't ask their doctors these questions, but they're mm. really important questions. And the doctor can take some of the burden off of the family by having some of those difficult conversations. So, so in terms of the, you know, literally, how do we handle this? I think going to a geriatrician, palliative care doctor, or neuropsychologist is the, the key. In terms of coping with, you know, how do, how do we deal with feet, with food? How do I deal with my own stress? There are many, many books, honestly. I hate to pick just one because there are many books on those specific things. I would go for a book written by a physician. So written by ideally a geriatrician or an internal medicine doctor or a family doctor or a neuropsychologist, PhD would be okay too. But somebody with expertise in geriatrics. Uh, I do have a book coming out, as I mentioned, Coping Courageously, which is less about the very specific, like what, how do we deal with 
crushing up food, but more about the the kind of psychological and spiritual and stressful coping with the grief of losing the person that you used to know, mm, mm. right? Because your mom or dad or sibling used to be this person and they're still here, but now they're a different person. And that's grief. And sometimes we don't give ourselves the opportunity to grieve that. And also having really difficult conversations, I think is extremely important. That's also in my book. How do we talk about what do you want near the end of your life? How do we talk as a family? How do we work together as a family to help mom or dad figure out what they should do, where they should live? Should they get help? What do we do with the finances? So ways to work together as a family. I think that is also really important. People sometimes go into their separate corners and and don't know how to talk to each other about really difficult things. So all of that is covered in my book, which will be out in January. But you can get a tremendous amount of help from uh, your physician's office and the neuropsychologist's office in terms of the specific things. Awesome. Awesome. This is very, very good. Um, and I can, uh, I, I, I can sense the ray of hope. Um, even through the season, Absolutely. based on our conversations. Absolutely. Um, and so, um, and any final words, you know, as, as you have someone maybe here who's watching, who's like, oh, man, this is this is what they're going through right now. And it feels overwhelming. And some days um, they, they just don't know what to do. Any words of encouragement before we wrap up? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would say two big things. The first is, that as a caregiver, you really do need to fill up your own cup and in, in order to have the strength to go through what is a very difficult experience. And when you're thinking about filling up your own cup, there are the things that empty it and the things you can do to fill it. So try to do less of what empties it, right? So maybe cut back at work if you can, take a little time off, stop volunteering right now, get someone, as we said before, to help with the chores and the things you don't like to do. Uh, if you're if you yourself are feeling depressed, that is depleting, that empties your cup, go to the doctor and get treatment or go to a therapist for support. If you're grieving, you could go to a grief counselor for support. So do less of what's emptying your cup. And then think about what are more things you can do that can fill up mm -hmm. your cup. That's part of why you need help. Go for a walk. Go read a book all by yourself. Have your private time. Do yoga if you like that or Tai Chi or Qigong. Meditate if you like that. Go to a therapist. Spend time with your friends. Garden, knit, crochet, do mm -hmm. art. What are the things that fill you up, that make you feel open and happy and joyful? And don't put those things on the side like, oh, I'll do those things later. Do those things right now because it will fill up your cup and make it easier to do hard things. So all of that was number one. <laughs> <I love it. laughs> number two, though is it sounds a little upside down, but see if you can find the beauty in this experience. And I know it's mm. hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. It's different. But this is still a human being. They still feel energy. They still have feelings. They're still connected here. You can still touch them and it's, that's meaningful to them. So see if you can find different ways to connect that are not the old ways. And rather than, than feeling agitated that it's not the old way, see if you can really dig into what happens now. When I make cookies, she seems happier with the smell. Mm. Great. Mm. You know, when I use this essential oil and I rub her hands, she seems to feel calmer. Right. When I turn on this kind of music, it makes her smile. So look for the small things, the small ways to connect with you as a human and your loved one as a human because you're both on this earth, you're both valuable like you were before, and you still have a connection. So try, try not to look past that, even if it's subtle, try to dig into that and find even more ways to connect. I love it. 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 And Doc, um, I have people who are watching who are like, well, first, what's the name of the book again? Because they want to... Hoping Courageously, A Heart-Centered Guide to Navigating a Loved One's Illness Without Losing Yourself. And it will be out on January 9th. And if anybody is interested and would like to know when it's out and have the link sent to them, they can go to my website 
and just sign up through the website and I'll be sure and send out um, a link to the book when it comes out. Is it okay if I share what my website is? Oh, oh yes, I'm already putting it in the comments as you're talking. <laughs> oh, fabulous. So integrativepalliative.com, integrativepalliative.com. And there you can just send me a message through the website or sign up through the website and I will be sure and send the link when it's ready. All right, awesome. So I've put that on the bottom uh, for those of you who are watching and also in the comment section as well, YouTube and on Facebook. Um, Dr. Uh, Delia is, is all over the web. So she, <laughs> she has um, an email address, which I put there. I also put her social media links. She's on the Twitter. She's on Instagram. She's on LinkedIn, um, on Facebook. Uh, I'm going to split it in half. Because she, you have you have a lot of places you're on. I'm all over the place. Yeah, some of <laughs> some of what people will find is medical education because I also teach physicians okay. and other clinicians about integrative palliative medicine, and also I provide support for families because my goal is that every clinician learns incredible skills in caring for families, putting together integrative and palliative medicine, so that physicians feel better and families feel better. I love what you do, Doc, and I have it on here. She has a lot of great contact tips on how to even navigate this season. I've seen her talk about that too. So um, you have it on the bottom of the screen and as well on the um, um, comment section as well. And Dr. Delia, are you also available to speak? And you know, for those who want to have you come speak to their audience, come encourage. Um, Absolutely. We'll have you, um, okay. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Yes, I, I speak. I speak often, and I and I, I love to speak both to medical audiences and to lay audiences about these integrative palliative topics. Yeah, awesome, reach out. Awesome. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. I know you're busy. I appreciate you taking the time to come back yet again to do this. I will be asking you again next six months to do this again. <laughs> no pressure. I would love it. Thank you so much for having me. You're, you are fantastic. I just love thank what you, you do. Your energy thank is you. so wonderful. And thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and for those of you who watch live and in replay, I forgot to say hashtag live, hashtag replay. You know the drill. Um, Dr. Mitra, thank you for joining. Dr. Um, Una, uh, Mr. Muiwa, Makita, thanks for joining as well and stopping by. And as always, if you or anyone you know is looking for an awesome, a Thor and compassionate family physician in the Massey, Texas area, I am she. And if you're looking for a speaker who's as awesome as Dr. Delia, who could talk about these seasons and beyond, you know what? If you know physicians that could use her, our input, please share this video with them. It would, it would, it would start a trajectory of physicians really doing well, um, helping people navigate this. So this is this is powerful. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much.